Morning guys, we're down in the beautiful Fish River Valley. You can see these beautiful valleys behind us, thick Fish River bush. And we are going to tell you about our second story for stalking shadows with myself, an outfitter story. And we're going on to episode two of season two. And I thought I'd tell you about a group of clients that came out or father and son that came out and hunted Mike and Aaron, what an awesome bunch of guys. I met them way back in, I think it was 20, 2011, 2012, round about there. And they came out on their first trip to SA and their package was to hunt a kudu each, an impala each, a gemspak, as we say in South Africa, gemspak, and gemspok, I should say. And um, they were after a warthog and impala. So I hand started as usual, picking the guys up from the airport after a long flight. We grabbed them in East London Airport and we headed on to the first concession. And at this stage, guys, it's still the same place where you hunt two different properties in a seven day trip. So it's very tight for time. So a lot of hunting has to happen, happen in a hurry. And we got to the hunting area the lodge we got all set up and got all the rifles out and it was quite interesting mark and aaron pulled out three rifles and the only two of them hunting but what they'd done is they'd brought along their grandfather's 30 odd six and either him or his dad would shoot something with his grandfather's rifle it was quite sentimental to them and it was quite a cool thing that i thought that You've traveled all the way to Africa. You've brought your grandfather's lucky whitetail hunting rifle. Brought his 30 odd six. Aaron whipped out a beautiful 7 mil rim mag that he hunted with. And uh, Mark had a 270. Pull out 270. If I'm not mistaken, it was a Thompson's Center 270. I think, I think it was a single shot. Yeah, 270. If memory is correct. And we headed off to the shooting range in a hurry and we got all set up, got all the rifles tuned in. And this is the first time that I was introduced to the Hornady GMX bullets. In South Africa, if a lot of you guys know, guys who have visited us previously know that we struggle to get ammunition here in South Africa and we struggle to get quality bullets to reload with or even quality ammo to to purchase and if we do get it it is extremely expensive so they were all shooting um gmx one of the gmx in their rifles and quite interestingly also a new thing for me aaron had whipped out a 139 grain gmx bullet for his seven mil and as a guard it was the first time i'd seen it and i was used to the traditional 165 grains that the guys come with for the seven mil remag and I was like, oh, it's quite light. So this thing's got some traveling distance to it. But shot at the range, the rifle shot beautifully. And we headed back to the lodge, got the guys all rested. It was first thing the next morning, we were leaving bright and early to head on over to my uncle's property or my grandfather's property at the, and head out and start hunting for kudu. And we got there and this is a, this is a nice little tip for, for the young guys, pro tip, if you want to call it. Obviously, I'd pre-planned to come and hunt there, made all the right phone calls and everything we need to do as guides to make sure that we get there and hunt correctly and do everything by the book. And as driving in on the property, a massive kudubu crossed the road in front of me from one side of the property into another section of the property. 
And I didn't just stop and shoot that kudu with my client. I always introduce, go and introduce my clients or introduce, go to the, the, the farmer and announce yourself that you're on the property, even though you've made pre-arrangements to do so and to hunt that day. So what I did was I dropped my, my tracker off with a radio and I headed down to the house and I left him there to keep eyes on this kudu bull that had gone into a little draw with about six kudu cows and went down, announced myself to my cousin and my uncle to say, hey, I've arrived, yeah, my clients, we've just spotted a kudu bull. And my cousin said, but why don't you stop and shoot it? I was like, no, because you know I was coming, but you might hear shots. And it could be someone else poaching along the road. And I get there and you ask me, what did I shoot at? And I say to you, well, I wasn't even on the farm yet. So always good. Go and announce yourself to say, I'm starting to hunt now, that you can report back to whoever's landowner or whatever concession you're hunting in or um, whatever the rules are at the spot that you're hunting. So with that, I rushed back, radioed the, the tracker. The tracker said, no, you still got eyes on the kudu pool. And... I left him sitting on the spot and myself and Aaron got the vehicle snuck up and parked away and we climbed the back side of this hill to look over into the draw where the kudubu was feeding with these cows. And we managed to, to sneak over and I got over and I, I couldn't see the bull. With that, that bull busted out there at 100 miles an hour. And I remember just throwing the sticks up and I said, Aaron, there's your bull. And I gave one bellow. I was like, yay! And the kudubu went and stood and looked back over his shoulder like that. And with that, Aaron thumped that bull. Duh. That seven mile, it went three steps and it fell over. And that was the start to our safari, which was awesome because now everyone's upbeat. Kudubu's down. You'll see in the photos that I share that there's still shadows where we're taking pictures. I was young back then, guys. I take a lot more time and... and and spend more time on taking quality photos now because those are the memories that you guys head home with and have those in you know waiting for your trophies to arrive and that's what you show people so it was all in the shadows i should have maybe pulled the bull out and put him in the sun and, and done the perfect photo but we were also amped up we took some pictures we carried the bull out which meant we got going and we carried on carried on hunting and I can't remember if we shot Mike's bull that afternoon or the next day we went and carried on with the hunting. I don't think we shot it that afternoon because I know it was a cold, cold, I think it was June or July they came out. And anyway, we, we hunted hard. We didn't get anything else. The next day we went out for Gemspak on a property close by. And we went after Gemspak and Zebra. And I think the first animal we got in the morning was a, a beautiful zebra stallion that we got with Mark. Also put a perfect spotted, some, and we had to shoot stallions. So we had to be very careful of what we were hunting and make 100% make sure that we spotted a stallion. And for those guides that hunt here in SA, we all know sexing a male and female zebra is extremely difficult. But for me, it's quite easy because... I've grown up in the horse industry, breeding horses, and you know, it to me it came easily. I can pick out a young stallion, so I was quite quite lucky in that sense. But a lot of other um, PHs struggle to sex uh, male and female zebra. So we spotted this this um, no, it wasn't the zebra. It was the zebra. No, we got the zebra. So we set up on the on the on the zebra. We got awesome stalk in. And we smoked the zebra. We took a beautiful photograph of the zebra. Mark had his, had his zebra. And we took a little walk. And then we bumped into what we were after, Gemspak. And we spotted another a Gemspak. And this is how quick things unfold, guys. So we shot a zebra. We went for a little walk bumped into a gemspak, Mark shot his gemspak, so we, Mark already had a, a, a zebra and a gemspak on the, on the board, and we took some nice photos of that, and then we 
struggled. Then all of a sudden the momentum slowed down. So that was done in the morning. And then in the afternoon, like towards the afternoon, we started struggling and bumping Hemsbuck. And these properties, guys, are massive. You're looking at, you know, 6,000 hectare properties, 12 to 14,000 acres. It's huge. You, you, you know, and these massive, massive big valleys like I got behind, thick rolling valleys, and you're glassing from one to the other. And we managed to get on this one lookout point and we spotted a, a Hemsbuck having a, a snooze, midday snooze. So we made an approach and we got as far as the cover would allow us. And I'll never forget this. I, I set Aaron up and he asked how far it was. And I said, yes, but this is a poke. It's like 300, I want to say 390 yards away. You know, I haven't got a range finder. I'm guessing it. I said, but damn, that's far. I said, if you're comfortable, you can take the shot. And he lined that chem's puck up and he thumped it. I don't think it even got up off the ground. It just stayed there. And I was like so impressed with these, these GMX Hornady bullets. They, everything we had shot was a one-shot kill. And from, you know, Gemsbuck being a very tough animal, zebra soaks up ammunition like no one's business. And these bullets were, thing, that little 139 grain, seven mil bullet, literally just was dropping things in their tracks the amount of terminal you know shock that was in those bodies was unbelievable and those animals were falling down there so also super excited we were still after another zebra so off we went and we bumped some zebra that were crossing a road but they kind of like crossed the road and they zigzagged back and eventually we we got on the road and we worked our way down and the female zebra came through the the road and she hesitated and went through and the big stallion came behind and stood and Aaron made a another smoke of a shot in the triangle the zebra's got a beautiful triangle to aim at and if I mean pinpoint accuracy with Aaron that was what his specialty was this trip and he thumped that zebra in the triangle it was no more perfect the little white spot in the middle and that's where he hit him and he just stiffened out his leg went turned and ran down the road and then just fell into a pile of dust so we'd done an ex had an extremely good day and we'd shot these animals and got it you know obviously the skinning process takes time the guys did full rugs with their zebras and all the shoulder mounts so the tracker was busy at it and i had a really good tracker at the time um, and he skinned brilliantly and he was super quick so we got all of that packed away and we headed off and we got back to the lodge and if I'm not mistaken we had still had a bit of time to go and hunt a warthog in the afternoon and we managed to find a warthog and this was the time that Mike brought the old 30 odd 6 with and with that we set him up on a beautiful nice big water ball and Mike pulled his shot ever so slightly and caught him mid of the gut like instead of behind the shoulder or on the shoulder he got him midway so it was a gut shot but the GMX bullet put such a lot of trauma in him that the pig didn't go very far and it lay down and with that we we tracked and we bumped him so I said to my track I said now bring the dogs so I had my little Jack Russell Zulu and I had a border collie called Oakley. He was brilliant. That that dog, yeah, very fond memories of them. And my tracker even had his own little Jack Russell that he brought with. So we stuck the three dogs on him and the chase was on. And we were in and out through the river valley, through the thick thorns and all that stuff. And eventually the dogs bait him up in a hole. And we got there and he was very much alive fighting with the dogs, but it was so thick that we had to try and I had to make sure that everyone was safe in the process. So now we stood there trying to figure out plans on how are we going to get this pig out. So I sat at the hole with Mark and Aaron and the tracker went off with the truck and went to go fetch a couple of guys. We thought, no, we're going to dig him out. And then he came back. My tracker quite, was quite an ingenious in bugger. He was a real rocket scientist when it came to trying to figure things out. And he brought an old piece of tennis court net. So I said, what the hell are we going to do with this? 
So he says, we're going to hang the net in front of the hole and we're going to start digging at the back. When the pig runs out the hole, the pig's going to get hooked up in the net and we're going to be able to shoot it or you know, the dog's going to be able to catch it and we're going to be able to get it. So I said to him, your plan sounds right, but it just sounds a little crazy with the amount of people we've got around and stuff like that. And eventually, what us crazy guides do, I said to the client, I said, give me the rifle. I'm going to crawl into this hole and I'm going to shoot the pig in the hole. Didn't have a 9mm at the time. I hadn't purchased my 9mm or a handgun of any sorts. So I crawled into this warthog hole on my stomach with a little torch in my hand and my rifle. And I managed to line up this pig. And as soon as I shot the pig, I crawled out there at 160 miles an hour because it was just a cloud of dust. I came out there, I was gray with dust on the top of my head because of the concussion and the shot inside. Rifle was covered in dust. And I managed to get out of that hole without that pig charging out. But I shot him so well that he just rolled over. Now came the, now came the trick of fetching him. So I said to the tracker, I said, you skinnier than me, you crawl in the hole and fetch the pig. And then there was this back and forth. So, no, I'm not going in that hole. Then he brought a mate with, and I said, well, we'll send him down the hole. He said, he's not going in the hole. So again, I had to go crawl in there. And I'm not a small guy, guys, and I had to fit in this thing. I was a lot smaller back then. And I got my hands stretched out, and I managed to grab both his tusks. And when I grabbed both his tusks in the front like that, I shouted, pull! And I had two guys or three guys on each foot. And the guys dragged me out there with the warthog in tow and we managed to pull it out the hole. And all jokes aside, it was quite tense, but everyone was safe, no one got hurt. Got the pig out the hole. Mike was super, super happy that he got his pig and we never lost it. The dogs worked extremely well. They were super excited that they got to do a nice run and they got, got a pig down the hole. And we took some awesome photos in the thick bush so there's a great picture of the warthog showing how thick it was next to the hole that we shot it in and that is one of the the craziest memories i've got as a guide actually crawling in after a warthog rifle in front of me in the dark with a little torch <laughs> to shoot it in the hole so that was our day we we really knocked it out the park that day and got to bed early and got cracking for the next morning could you hunt and I remember hunting extremely hard with with Mark to get his kudu and we eventually found this beautiful wide kudu bull and it was a super tough shot and the pressure was on because it was the last day we could hunt this area then we had to leave to go to the next lodge where we would hunt impala and and bless buck and so on and so forth and we got there and we I think it was, it was in the morning that we got there and we did our stalk and we saw a couple of young bulls and nothing great. And we eventually got to a spot where we saw a kudu bull, but one of these typical kudu bull poses where it's horns, head, just sticking out the, out the brush. And all you can see is a very small part of his chest. And a frontal shot is extremely tough on an animal, guys. Your margins are super, super small. And it can go pear-shaped quite quickly. And with this, we set Mike up with his 270. And I said, Mike, if you're comfortable, let him have it. And he put that cross right in the, in the chest. And he took his time and that kudubul just stared at us. He wouldn't move. He was standing dead still. And Mike squeezed that trigger and that kudubul just vanished in the bushes like that. It just disappeared. And I was like, wow, we got him. Now we send the tracker there. Now we can't find the kudu. Now it's like stress-wise, man, did we hit it? Did we miss it? Did we... And I'm going, man, that shot was perfect. I watched the kudu bull fall in my binoculars. It went down. It didn't spin and crash through the trees. It didn't jump. It just fell like it was shot in the head. And eventually I went back to where we stood from and I put my shooting sticks out and I was looking at the tree where we'd marked it. And we were probably off by 10 yards. And I said to the tracker, no, just walk, walk to your right. And he walked to the right, and yeah, the kudubu was lying dead in its tracks in that spot. And again, guys, I can't preach much more about those GMX bullets. They did the job. 
shocked that kudu bull that it fell right there. There was no track to recover. And we've got this beautiful kudu bull <coughs> with Mike. So we get that all loaded up, guys. And as I said, now we've got to move on to our next place. So we have a snooze. The next morning, we up bright and early, a good breakfast. Got everyone, all the clients packed up. All the dogs packed up. And off we went. And we ended up at the lodge and we went out for the last four animals we had on our list were Blesbuck and Impala. It was a Blesbuck and Impala each. Yeah. So we went out and I found this beautiful big Blesbuck ram on one of these big grass rolling hills. And... No problem for Aaron. The wind's cranking. We've leopard crawled, set him all up. Boom, and he smoked his, his bless buck. Didn't go very far. Fell right there. Did the, did the famous death run where they you shoot it and it runs 50 to 100 yards. And next minute, just the legs disappear and it does a steamroll. So he shot a beautiful bless buck there. And as we were going along, I'm not mistaken, we saw, saw another blessed buck and we've got, got Mark's blessed buck out the way. Guys, I'm trying to remember this stuff as we're going along. I've uh, sadly lost a lot of my photographs for this trip in moving house and computers and phones crashing and so on and so forth. So I'm still trying to remember. I've got through the photos that I've been going through and we got a blessed buck for him. And with that, we saw a beautiful impala, big wide shaped impala ram. And Aaron had a crack at him and smoked him. And that was an instant, nice little stalk. And all we had to do was shoot a Impala for Mark. And on our way out, we spotted some Impala through like a little draw. And Mark and I hopped out. The Impala ram had a beautiful swoop backwards. So we, we judge length where the horn comes out like this and then it hooks back. And then it comes up. So it's got to look like an armchair side profile. And then when from the front, they've got to be open. Often as youngsters, their horns get kinked and bent and you get offset horns and so on and so forth. So I judged this Impala from a side profile and caught a glimpse of one of his horns going, okay, he's nice and long. And we shot this Impala across the valley, boom. And when we got there, the Impala was kind of goofy, a little bit offset, but a nice old mature ram. And that was the end of our safari. And it's super exciting to make these friendships with these clients. And I've made lifelong friends. Aaron and I talk, you know, regularly as much as we can. We drop messages with each other. I keep in touch with them on social media. And the best part about being a guide is, is living through all these experiences and, and doing the hunt and then getting that email from a client that I've received my trophies and getting the photos of the excitement of the guys hanging their stuff on their walls back home and you know reliving all of those memories because it is a bit of a process for you guys to get your trophies back and having it mounted yeah and then getting there and then getting all put on the wall yeah you just get to relive it all so as a guard I think that's probably one of the the best feelings um, you get is being able to relive those memories with your clients again, especially if you keep in touch with them like I do and try and make lifelong friends. So for you who are watching this and are wanting to come and experience the beautiful Eastern Cape with myself and our African Brother Safari team, don't hesitate to get in contact with us. Drop us a message even in the comments below and I'll get in contact with you. And let's plan a trip of a lifetime and come and make memories in South Africa. It's not as expensive as everyone thinks it is to come and hunt in SA, guys. If you get hold of the right guy and you plan the right trips, it's just as affordable as going on a whitetail hunt back in the States and you get to hunt probably four or five different species for the same price as one big whitetail in the states so till later guys cheers